Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Crystal Ballroom in St Kilda. Originally called the Terminus, the George Hotel was constructed in stages between 1880 and 1930. Uh, at the time St Kilda was a very um, beautiful seaside town for the wealthy people of Melbourne. Um, about I think after World War II the hotel fell into decay in the 60s, they tried to modernise it by adding things like, you know, a birdcage bar. And they did have cabaret acts. People like Barry Crocker and Helen Reddy actually performed there. In the 70s, a seedy side started to emerge in St Kilda. They had, um, you know, drug dealers, petty criminals and prostitutes all frequenting the public bar. And in about 1976, the hotel owners did try to improve the image and they named the hotel the Seaview Hotel. Now, that same year, I believe they sold it to Graham Richmond and Kevin Shelton. The ballroom, I believe, really kind of started to become popular and, you know, exciting due to the efforts of Dolores San Miguel. There she is there. Um, apparently, she was stuck one night uh, when she needed a, a room for the band The Secret Police to play at. And uh, she knew Graham and asked if whether she could use one of the rooms at the hotel he agreed, and then after that, about once a month, she was able to book bands more regularly, uh, and then it just sort of spiralled from there. Jab was really the first band to actually play at the Crystal Ballroom, um, although at the hotel, I guess, because in the actual ballroom itself, I believe the first um, artists were Paul Kelly and the Dots, as well as the Boys Next Door, and a duo, Tim McEwen, who was in drag and, you know, sang songs, and there was another guy with him playing piano. Now, Graham invited a bloke called Laurie Richards uh, to take over and book the higher profile acts. And, you know, he had a lot of connections. He was running the Tiger Room at Richmond. So eventually Dolores did come back in 1980. She ran the Paradise Room, which was downstairs at the front of the um, hotel, and, you know, there were bands like Birthday Party, who used to be the boys next door, that were really popular, you know, attracting crowds, and a whole bunch of, you know, fantastic musicians that, that used to play there. Now, I do recommend this memoir by Dolores. It's called, um, if you can see it there, uh, yeah, it's the Melbourne Punk and Post Scene, The Ballroom, and it sort of details a lot about the ballroom, a lot about her life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Changing trends and financial difficulties did take their toll on the hotel, on the ballroom, um, and it led to its closure in about 1985, where the Liquor Act, the police, the council, lots of things were conspiring. Um, I think by mid-86, actually, the hotel was up for sale, and it officially closed in 1987. So here I am at 125. Fitzroy Street, St Kilda, and I was uh, looking for the Crystal Ballroom, which was located in the CU Hotel in St Kilda. And looks like I found it, so there it is there, on busy Fitzroy Street in sunny St Kilda today. Now, they did redevelop it in 1995, turned it into apartments or something, and the actual ballroom itself um, inside the hotel did become uh, a function room by Don Levy Fitzpatrick, who kind of controlled it all. And if you look on the George Hotel website, you can actually see 
whatever happened to the ballroom well it's all on that website some fantastic images and you get an idea of you know what it is now what is punk there's a great documentary produced by gatherer media a bunch of blokes who produced this three-part documentary series and it charts the birth the rise and the fall of australian punk and new wave <coughs> the scene so let's hear from um, mick harvey from boys next door uh, Gavin from Babbies and also Clinton um, Walker, the journalist. Punk rock is music with an attitude blurted out in a completely unambiguous manner. Punk has come to mean and probably did mean at the time the more extreme and just fast, loud. Punk was the antidote to deceptive speech of the 70s. It was like a new wave of artists and ideas. The early 70s were a fantastic period for music. Uh, Sabbath and Zeppelin and Bowie and Bowie, fantastic. But by the mid 70s, anything that was good there had lost its edge, it had gone lame. Punk had to happen because music had become arcane. The introductions were too long, the solos were too long, the performance of the musicians was too ridiculous and absurd. The music scene had become really weighed down by expectations of high level musicianship and high quality production. If you weren't into what was on Countdown, it was kind of like, well, stiff shit. Punk emerged from the working class in London, but almost everywhere you can kind of, you know, sort of understand that a lot of art students and people that were sort of seeking an identity were probably the catalyst for the change that happened in the mid 70s when you know, the punk explosion and, and all that sort of, you know, fashion and everything that tied into it kind of exploded on the scene. Now, in Melbourne, the ballroom was like an off-campus hangout for inner-city art students. And, you know, after, you know, reading a bit of um, literature and, you know, interviews on YouTube with people that were actually at the ballroom and in the thick of it, I think a lot of people, what I've understood is that a lot of people that were there at the time never really called themselves punks. In fact, a lot of people that used to go were middle class folks from the suburbs um, and some of them had to actually reinvent themselves to appear working class. Very interesting. In England and America, I believe, you know, the rise of punk was probably due to the social political unrest, you know, going on in the countries. Um, that whole Sex Pistols, Ramones, The Clash, all that sort of stuff. It exploded, you know, fashion sort of tied in, um, people like Vivian Westwood, you know, the Sex Pistols kind of just in your face. Um, yeah, it made for some very exciting sort of um, creativeness, you know, creativity was everywhere. Uh, I do believe that in those countries, they were feeling a lot of angst and a lot of unrest, but I kind of don't think that it was really the same feeling in Australia. And I guess, look, the people that migrated to the St Kilda area, you know, they were, they might have been on the dole, they mightn't have had a lot of money, um, yeah, but, you know, they were sort of living near the beach and um, some of them were probably living with their parents. So I just think it was a different, you know, the cause of that whole evolution of punk was a bit different in Australia than it was uh, overseas. Now, these young Australians were making uh, some fantastic music, without boundaries you know they formed a lot of bands and started independent labels a lot of people were running live music venues and everything was kind of in in this area anyway outside that commercially driven mainstream industry that was happening you know in Australia in Melbourne the scene seems to be defined by three locations and even ideologies the North Fitzroy Beat St Kilda's Crystal Ballroom and the Clifton Hill Community Music Centre now, a lot of people have said that the catalyst for that whole punk scene in Melbourne in particular was the boys next door. And not only did they sound different, they looked different, you know, they were dressed in op shop sort of suits. Uh, they were well read, uh, very creative with their music and their attitude. And there's lots of information out there about that whole sort of scene, I guess. Check this book out. It's called Inner City... Um, Sound by Clinton Walker. I recommend it. It's awesome. So energy, you know, fashion, punk. There's so many sort of um, 
you know, descriptions of that whole punk scene and, you know, people kind of yelling out death to disco and, you know, rolling their eyes when they sort of would hear the pub rock sort of music coming on the airwaves. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of kind of division with people that liked, you know, different genres of music. Now, a lot of people who um, talk about the ballroom say that it was like a, a social hub for social misfits looking for a place to fit in. And the beauty about it was you didn't even have to know how to play an instrument or sing. Um, it wasn't even a place just for musicians. There were a lot of visual artists that attended. Uh, there were fashion designers, poets, filmmakers, writers, and just general, you know, punters that were there for the music. So the whole kind of scene, I think, was controlled by people who actually cared, you know, about their art. And, you know, people who felt a sense of belonging, kind of like a finding your tribe sort of, you know, sensibility. I personally think it was a very do-it-yourself attitude and a very F you to that whole kind of mainstream sort of corporate sort of um, music industry. Now, it is important to note that this subculture, I think, was often expressed in print uh, by a lot of independent music papers, you know, and magazines. Pulp, Fast Forward, Tension, you know, Bruce Milne, what a legend, and others like him. Uh, I, I've seen, you know, 1980 was just a year of massive creativity. It was just, yeah, it flourished. It was fantastic. I was lucky enough to chat with Fiona Lee Maynard, so check it out. Um, she shares her personal memories of the Crystal Ballroom. So, Fiona Lee Maynard, thank you again for joining me um, on my trip down, you know, former live music venues in Melbourne. What can Thanks, you Joy. Yeah, thank you. What can you tell me about the Crystal Ballroom in St Kilda? Well, that was um, a mighty, mighty place that uh, I got to sneak into with the, uh, the help of a fake ID when I was... <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> you know it wasn't that hard all you had to have was a photocopy and some liquid paper and, 100%. Um, yeah my friend slash chaperone at the time Chris Dunn who went on to um, work at Waterfront Records oh, wow. and um, with other bands up in Sydney when he moved up there he used to um, pick me and my other friend Sandra Cuts up and we'd we'd go into the Crystal Ballroom and watch whoever was playing. Wow. But we saw Sunny Boys, the Moodists. I saw Iggy Pop play there one time. Oh, wow. He kicked his bass player on stage and I left the room in disgust and started talking <laughs> to Tracy Pugh in the corridor instead. Oh, wow. He, wow. He was a cousin of a boy I went to school with, two boys actually. And, yeah. Um, so he was always really friendly to me and Fantastic. we just talked about Base players get an unfair deal, but it was it was always like as packed as it could be. You could see yeah. a band in the front room um, opposite where uh, the I think we we'll go go started out of the cage there, and um, we used to go up the stairs, and there would be another band there. There was at one stage there were three different band rooms, so oh, wow. I remember, um, the the. The basement had something like the Johnnies and um, sort of like a cow punk thing going on. And then I, w I walked up the stairs a bit and there was a full on hardcore punk oh, wow. kind of scene up there. But everybody just blended with everybody else I as love well. That. So, yeah, it was, um, yeah, really vital and vibrant time. I'm really glad I got to go and actually I think my first band Ewigs UP got to play one time there and then what happened was Fred Negro <laughs> played and had a um a small dick competition <laughs> where um, the <laughs> and, um, he had all the guys lined up on stage and was like hey, that's too big kind of thing <laughs> Um, that was when the liquor licensing people oh. came in. <laughs> and when <laughs> that was close. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Like how long was it a music venue for? Oh, man, four years um, because prior to it being Crystal Ballroom, it used to be. Um, the Sea View? Uh, this is the show, like even before that, like Helen Reddy played. There. Oh, wow. It was, it was like a um, really upper class kind of cabaret oh, wow. so, you were one stage yeah years and years ago I think it was 
mainly because of Dolores, uh, San Miguel, and um, oh, the Richmond. They they started up the venue and uh, with all the local bands. So it was um, from then on a St Kilda kind of icon. And, uh, I think Hunters and Collectors did their first ever rehearsal in the front room there. Oh, okay. And, but Nick Cave played there, the birthday party. You know, I did, yeah, the, I did read that. I did also hear that it was um, associated with maybe, I don't know if this is true, the dark side of Melbourne. Is the it? dark side. <laughs> I hate to uh, comment that or talk about that. Mean but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the bar downstairs was, um, they call it the snake pit now, but it was... Um, it was a place where some local gangsters would hang oh, out. Oh, okay, and maybe, maybe would, that's what they were referring to. <laughs> would go in there for a bit of uh, shelter as well. Yeah. Oh wow, um, interesting. But yeah, there was a, a few a few things like that going on. But I was a little bit too young to know that at the time. I sort of I learned about it while doing the St Kilda Music Walking Tours with Fred Negro and um, Rob Wellington. Wow, yeah. interesting. Bands that played at the ballroom, Jab, The Fiction, um, who played really early on, and they evolved into Little Murders. Rob Wellington, he started the International Exiles, I think. Um, the band The Ears, they had Sam as, their, uh, as the inspiration uh, for the movie Dogs in Space with uh, Michael Hutchins and Saskia. Uh, the Additions, they played at the ballroom and there's a fantastic song called Nuns and Priests, which was their anthem to the Crystal Ballroom. Check it out. <laughs> Some other bands that played at the ballroom, The Young Charlatans, Seminole Rats, La Femme, Essendon Airport, Tss Tss Tss, The Fabulous Marquis, uh, you know, lots of bands, Babies, The Reels, Secret Police, who became Little Heroes, Fizz Pops, The Corpse Grinders, The Jetsons, who were short-lived, but they did become Hunters and Collectors. Um, I think the Hoodoo Gurus played there, Sacred Cowboys, Worldly World, Serious Young Insects, lots and lots of bands. Um, the Wreckery, obviously the Birthday Party I've mentioned, you know, the Saints I believe played there as well. Uh, the Negatives who apparently would um, split into the Moodists. So yeah, Dave Graney and Claire actually uh, have spoken a lot about the, the ballroom. You can find stuff of, about that on YouTube. Um, the numbers in excess, um, a lot of rock and roll bands from sort of the suburban popular venues did uh, play at the ballroom as well. Even bands like the Sunny Boys, the Scientists, Celebrate Rifles and the Suburban. Um, Midnight Oil played there, Teenage Radio Stars who would morph into the models, the Johnnies played there, one of my favourite bands, uh, Hudson Creepers and as well they had a lot of international bands that played there. Um, people like Dr. Feelgood, The Stranglers, uh, UK Squeeze, um, Magazine, XTC, Simple Minds, The Cure, uh, The Dead Kennedys, PIL, um, The Residents, I think from America, they played there, and Iggy Pop. Uh, there's a story about Iggy Pop actually who apparently he nearly dropped the lighting rig into the crowd when he was, you know, climbing speaker stacks and just swinging from from one thing to another, back and forth. So yeah, um, that would have been interesting. Another feature of uh, the ballroom was on uh, Thursday night, they had these shows where it was free and there was like this vision of uh, patrons shuffling back and forth between the ballroom and the Prince of Wales because they had the same thing happening over there. So that would have been a, a really cool night on a Thursday. And I can't sort of um, talk about the Crystal Ballroom without talking about the phenomena of the little bands. So Disposable comes to mind when I think about that. Uh, they were basically makeshift bands with rotating band members that would sort of stage these spontaneous one-off gigs, usually once a month, 
and it was all organized by members of the primitive calculators um basically yeah the guys would sort of invite from the band uh, would invite anyone to step up and use their instruments and yeah it sounds like a real hoot there's a whole list of the little bands that uh, i'll put up so you can have a look uh, Stuart from the Primitive Calculators did actually quote that the Ramones' first album was the huge, you know, event in his life that kind of inspired that whole trajectory into the music world. The geography of the Yarra River is fascinating me. Apparently there's this North River, South River, wherever you came from is kind of, I don't know, something strange happening there. Richard Lowenstein, he quoted in 2011 that the North Fitzroy bands used to fight with the St Kilda bands and 30 years later, to this day, apparently, they're still waging these battles. I'm not sure about that. If you know anything about that, write it in the comments. And as well, Roland S. Howard, the gorgeous, God bless him, Roland S. Howard, rest in peace, he's quoted in uh, the documentary We're Living on Dog Food that apparently the people in um, The Boys Next Door weren't actually welcome on the other side of town because they were seen as phonies and rich kids. Yeah, I'm not really understanding that, but yeah, apparently it was real. Memories of the Crystal Ballroom. So um, Roadrunner, that magazine Roadrunner, they had their second birthday party with some musicians um, at the Crystal Ballroom. Rob Wellington, his first band, uh, was actually um, Obsessions with Roland S. Howard, although they never played live. But he did play with um, The Fiction at the ballroom, who are actually still playing to this day, as well as International Exiles. Lindy Morrison of The Go-Betweens, she remembers the birthday party at the ballroom, and she describes them as um, writhing, moaning animals who are loud, gutsy, and bluesy. So, yeah, very interesting. She also noted that uh, the intake of drugs uh, during that period was a huge part of the whole scene, uh, in keeping people overstimulated and active creatively. Now, again, you can sort of read about that dark side in this book. Um, yeah, Dolores's book. Philip Brophy, I wanted to just quickly mention Philip. He played with Tisk Tisk. He's a um, musician, a graphic designer. Uh, I think in the late 70s, he did a radio show, Eek, in Melbourne with Bruce Milne. I just wanted to mention him because he's got this fantastic article called Punk Explosion as a Revolution. It's on his website. I think it's philipbrophy.com or something. Check it out in my description. He's fantastic. Alan Bamford from 3RRR, a broadcaster, he wanted to document stuff and he basically went along to, to gigs, pressed his uh, cassette recorder, pressed record on it, and then he would go back to the radio station and play songs and this included stuff that was happening at the crystal ballroom amazing sean bowley he remembers john lydon from pil strapping a circular neon halo to his head and after playing a couple of sex pistols songs because apparently melbourne was known to be the you know punk city of australia or something the front runners uh, front rowers started spitting on him and uh, he replied that you know, that was long dead and gone, and he sort of shouted at them, look, if you don't stop spitting on me, I'm going to spit back at you and give you all AIDS. So, yeah, and I think he actually didn't really play for long. And I don't know, looking at some of the articles, I think a lot of the bands back then really only played 30-minute sets. Ash Wednesday from Jab and the Models, uh, he recalls that, you know, the spiral staircase leading from, you know, at the bottom to the actual ballroom itself was like a convenient arena to be seen. Um, yeah, you know, people that were dressed in everything from, you know, leather studs and safety pins, uh, you know, coloured hair, garbage bags, skin tight plastic garments, you know, the whole works, those, you know, white shirts, skinny ties. So it would have been an absolute vision. Dave Graney, he remembers seeing the birthday party at the ballroom, as well as Iggy Pop. Um, Hunters and Collectors, he remembers, uh, used to be able to rehearse at the ballroom for months with their own PA. And he said that when they played their debut, there were about 400 people there, and he said they sounded absolutely amazing. Dave and um, Claire, actually, uh, from the Moodists, and um, now Dave Graney and, you know, his other bands, they do actually uh, talk about the, the Crystal Borum as being like a, a lounge room and, and a whole playground for them. Bruce Milne is a pretty important figure in the Melbourne music scene and Australia. 
uh, with, you know, his radio shows, his fanzines, record labels, shops. I think in 1978, uh, Bruce and Clinton Walker from Inner City Sound, Clinton Walker, um, he found, oh, he did a radio show, I think, back then. And as well as that, Bruce um, founded a Go-Go Records with Philip Morland. Um, and what a great bloke, you know, releasing a lot of recordings of that whole punk and new wave scene in Melbourne. Uh, bands like The Young Charlatans, Little Murders, The Zorros. So, yeah, just a, a, a fabulous thing to do, really. An interesting thing that Bruce did mention once was that the indoor culture had a major effect on Melbourne punk. And I guess by that he meant, you know, the dark clothing, the brooding looks, the arty attitude, things like that. I kind of have to agree with him on that. Ollie Olsen's best memory was the last time that his band Whirly Wind played, and that was on New Year's Eve 1979. He did say that the international and interstate bands went down really well as a rule with the crowd. So as I've mentioned, um, you know, there is a lot of stuff out there, a lot of literature, books, videos, even artworks. There's a fabulous um, website that I really want to highlight, punkjourney.com. It's got everything you ever want to know about punk, um, mostly in Australia but in Melbourne, um, and it is compiled and managed by the wonderful Melinda Van Wayward. I'll put it in the description. Honestly, it's got everything you ever want to know. It's just very comprehensive and very good. Lots of beautiful photos and fantastic information. As well, you can find podcasts. There's one about the ABCs, um, or there's one on the ABC called Dance, Do That Dance or something. Um, yeah, just check it out. You just Google everything and you can find lots of stuff. There's even a book by Kirsten Krauth called uh, Almost a Mirror. Um, and as well, you know, if you want to sort of go into specifics, Mark Mordew's Boy on Fire uh, is a book about Nick Cave. Apparently that's really good. The movie Dogs in Space, it was directed by Richard Lowenstein in 1986. That really does kind of uh, show a whole bunch of, um, you know, Australians living in those share houses and that whole kind of scene. Uh, the video Punk Line 1980, you can find that on YouTube and that's got some fantastic images of the ballroom and people that were there. So that's really good. The documentary, We're Living on Dog Food, that's another video that I highly recommend. Just Google it. You'll find it some on some platform and it's got fabulous memories or interviews actually of people that were there, you know, people like Roland S. Howard, um, Dolores and, and many more. So it's really worthwhile watching that one. There are certain little sparks, you know, it's what people call the zeitgeist. I thought, my goodness, this is magic, something exciting. It was utterly exciting. It was the most exciting. I can't believe how excited I used to get. You could do anything that you wanted to do and you didn't have to have incredible musical skills. The fact that it was actually saying something truly deeply anti-social. Artsiness, pretentiousness and being a wanker was not a problem. Thanks for watching everybody. I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog. Um, be sure to check out uh, all my other vlogs and I will be having some more vlogs um, of live music venues as well as bands. I'm going to sort of venture into that area. Thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Cheers. Fucking down. <laughs> going to St Kilda. It was like, oh my God, is this heaven? Fuck, there's 60 gigs on tonight. You could end up going to a fucking folk show. It was really the centre for rock and roll. Seeing, you know, Nick Kay staggering up the street off his nut. <laughs>